just letting you know that um, before we get into this great podcast for Josh Malman, um, I'm going to be in Philadelphia at the Society of Nuclear Medicine meeting, the American Society of Nuclear Medicine meeting in just a few weeks' time. So drop me a line if you want to meet me. Drop me a line if you've got an interesting project, a great research idea, a new product, anything that you want to do with nuclear medicine, meet me in Philadelphia. Let's do a podcast there and uh, uh, keep in touch. Bye. Well, welcome to another uh, episode of the Nuclear Medicine Molecular Podcast. And we're talking to you from Melbourne at the World Federation of Nuclear Medicine and Biology. And to, today we've actually got the most important speaker. We've had, we've had uh, at this conference, we've had two Nobel Prize winners speak. But in my attitude, I think the most important person that we're going to speak to actually is the person next to me. And that's a patient advocate because sometimes we forget that uh, that, that, that uh, the patient is the most important aspect of what we do, probably even more important than whether we get first author on publications. So perhaps, um, uh, so it's, it's just my moment. Now, I want you to tell us a little bit about your story. Sure. And first of all, I'm humbled to be in, even, even in the room with uh, two Nobel laureates. Um, their talks were fantastic, just really special. And, and I'm really glad to be here representing the patient community. Um, on Friday, during the president's uh, dinner, they showed the history of the WFNMB and the, you know, the conferences that were in um, 2014 and 2010 as we, as we go backwards in time. And I was sitting next to someone and said, you know, at that conference, I didn't even know nuclear medicine existed because I was looking at things that were 2006 and 2000. And it was like, I, I didn't even, and my father's a physician. I, right. I didn't even know this, this whole area existed um, because you don't know it until you need it. And, yeah. and really, that is where my story begins. Uh, I was a patient that was diagnosed um, in my middle 40s uh, when I was 46 with a neuroendocrine tumor. Um, and I didn't even know what that was. And I come from a a family of physicians, uh, sister-in-law, mother, uh, mother and father, and and a support organization that that had no idea what I was facing and what this would mean. Um, and I certainly quickly learned that there wasn't a lot that was being done in neuroendocrine tumors, or that what there was, there wasn't a lot of approved therapies in the United States where right. I was diagnosed. Um, I was fortunate even with a very large tumor burden, um, I was relatively stable. And so I went on to try to educate myself. Uh, patients are really dislike the, um, the term watch and wait, which is what some oncologists use, yeah. even if it's the right thing though, that yeah. you should wait to see how the, the, the disease progresses. Uh, progresses. And I, I decided to change that, um, that whole line of thinking to watch and learn, and that when I wasn't needed to be treated or when my disease wasn't progressing, I would learn what I could so that when the time came to make some decisions on therapy or anything else, that I would have that background, that I would be able to not be afraid and make an educated decision instead of a hurried and rushed decision. And so I took my time of stability because I was a blind pickup. I had no symptoms. It was, bam, you have cancer and it looks pretty big and bad. Um, to really learn about my disease and who was treating it and where they were treating it, wherever it was. And actually, that's where I found and, and ran into uh, Dr. Baum, who was giving a, a, a talk in, in Toronto at a conference. And it was a three-day conference, and the first two days were on somatostatin analog therapies, which didn't apply to me because I didn't have... Um, any active symptoms, um, and on surgeries, which didn't apply to me because I had so much massive disease that it was um, something that would probably kill me right. by going. And so I'd gone through two days of this conference, almost falling asleep, um, until uh, Dr. Baum came on and said, you know, you, you can't treat what you can't see, and you're treating things, I, I'm hearing these stories about 17-hour surgeries because you find things once you're in there, or that you're, you're trying this drug, but you are imaging with that drug so that you have no idea how they're actually working against each other because you're imaging with something different than how you're doing therapy with. And, you know, my background as a Silicon Valley executive, I, I worked in high tech and I like data. Yeah. 
And it was like, oh wait, here's data points. I've got data points. I got to go do something with this. And so I, that, that became my introduction to nuclear medicine. And I went off and um, within two months had a scan, uh, my first gallium 68 uh, dota talk in uh, 2008. Um, I wasn't someone who would be treated because I was still stable. Um, I didn't have any symptoms. But I became symptomatic within six months. And instead of being worried about what was going on, we had a plan. We knew that I was highly receptive. I had a high SUV. Um, I would be probably an ideal candidate or that at PRT using some form of isotope and, and peptide would be a really good um, way for me to go. And so I did get treated. And I had three treatments in the course of um, a year that really regressed my disease. And where did you get treated? I got treated with uh, because it wasn't available in the US and um, I had become friendly with Dr. Baum and he was very receptive to saying, if you need treatment, I'm happy to treat you. You will be able you will be a good candidate. And when I became symptomatic and hospitalized, I actually sent him a note that said, you know, I think I need treatment. And he said, no, you're fine. And I said, no, uh, my disease is vipoma, and it did not, for a while, it didn't show up. I, I was normal, and then um, about 18 months into my disease uh, arc, um, vipoma decided to show up. And I was, uh, you know, it's a whole different conversation on talking to doctors and, and working about language, but I would have arguments with physicians about what diarrhea is because diarrhea is <laughs> refined. And you, you have these interesting things. I think I'm having diarrhea. Well, how often do you go? Twice a day. No, you're not having diarrhea. OK. Well, <laughs> I think I'm having diarrhea. OK. Um, are you able to have accidents at night? No. Um, are you able to control it until you can go to the bathroom? Yes. No, you don't have diarrhea. But I knew something was wrong, and I'm not I'm a pretty verbal person, yeah. and I wasn't able to describe this, what was an out-of-body experience, and with the words that many physicians could not understand. And after I was hospitalized the second time for having um, um, a potassium level that was 2.4, right. um, yeah. Yeah. and and having the uh, attending physician say, well, we're going to put some potassium in. Um, yeah, it'd be interesting to find out how much you output in a, take this, you know, to, how much do you output? And I said, what do you mean? I said, well, how much do you go a day? I said, like, in what format? And he said, you know, how many liters do you poop a day? And I said, do you know anyone who actually can answer that question, who isn't a doctor or who hasn't? He said, um, well, I need to know that. And he gave me, said, here's a hat. Go home after we pump you up with some potassium. And for the next week, I want you to measure how many hats you go a day. And I looked at him and I said, well, I go on demand. And I went to the bathroom and came back out and said, I did four and a half hats. And he looked at me and said, we're hospitalizing you. Um, <laughs> and you have diarrhea. And I said, that's what I've been saying for the last two months, that I've had <laughs> diarrhea. And anyway, language is a really hard thing. Um, so I had these treatments. Take I got, message number one, listen to your patients. Well, not only listen to the patients, but that <laughs> language is hard. Language is a difficult thing, and communication is something we, you have to have. You know, to have communication, you have to have a shared experience. And there was no, it's like, you don't have diarrhea. Well, I have something that's really bad. <coughs> um, so um, that was the challenge. And, what the next really step in my, you know, you talk about patient education or you talk about advocacy, um, I could have left it there. Um, yeah. I could have left it where I got treated and then I went home, you know, yeah. and that went back to my life. Um, but I was in working, I found support groups in the United States and I was listening to other stories of people who didn't have access or could not get care. And and then, you know, Dr. Palm also invited me to the first Theranostics World Congress, and I didn't know why I was going to be in a congress full of uh, uh, radio pharmacists and other physicians. And um, he had a better plan for me, which was, you need to be able to bring this back and, and, and bring this to other patients so that they can advocate or that we can get a bigger voice for this. And that really started 
um, you know, me thinking after going through this Congress of how much this type of therapy or this type of diagnostic um, imagery could really change the arc of other patients. And so that's really where I started advocating and putting up a site for um, people to understand PR treatment much better and also to start working with medical societies to try to help promote patient education and to give voice to the patients when they went to see members of Congress or members of governmental bodies um, and to really not let the conversation die. And yeah. I remember the first time that I went to an SNM, SNMMI meeting in Miami um, and I was riding back on a bus with uh, the head of the Clinical Trials Network who I had just talked into joining the Gallium 68 working group because we weren't going anywhere without direction. And she said, you know, you put a face on what we're doing and now when you're in the meeting, we know we have a sense of purpose and we're not just arguing whether it's Dota Talk or Dota Tate or which is, it's like we know we need to get something done. And so the voice of the patient not only helps, you know, educate other patients and, and puts us, you know, working together to get things done. You know, it, it also helps remind physicians what it is they're working forwards and, and towards. And, and as I, it, there was great resistance to gallium 68 um, imaging for net patients in the United States in 2012. Yeah. You, we first met in India, right? Yeah. And we were getting, people were getting treatment in India but couldn't get it in the United States. Yeah, and it's not only treatment, it's, it's also imaging. And, and uh, you know, I understand more about the approval process than I ever imagined I would. And, you know, you need backing in the U.S. to get things done. But I think you also need champions. You need <coughs> um, people who are going to stress how important this is so that you soldier forward. These things are tough, especially when there's not um, a commercial backer. Yep. And it's tough to understand what is completely required when you're not necessarily of there. And I work closely in the oncology community. I sit on now NCI task force. So I understand drug development and how challenging that is. Um, but I also understand that we had a diagnostic that would change the outcomes of people's lives. It would change the arcs of their lives. And that that was worth fighting for. And so starting in 2012, that was really, there were monthly meetings with the Gallium 68 working group on how to bring um, Gallium into, Gallium 68 into, um, you know, harmonize it. So one of the biggest learnings, you asked me that when, when I walked in, it's like, you know, what do, I, what do you want me to tell um, the nuclear medicine community or the, the doctor community is, is that, you know, it was great to be able to treat people one-off and to build things where you could save people and really change their lives. But, and, and I often see the, the science slide about uh, crossing the valley of the death. And in doing that, you also have to make sure that you're doing the steps. And, and you know, the Nobel laureate also spoke of that, um, uh, Brian Schmidt, of that you need to understand the processes that um, you need to achieve to get to your final goal. And really the final goal is that patients have access. Yes. That patients have wide access, not singular access. And by doing, you know, one of the things we worked really hard on on the Gallium 68 working group was harmonizing data. So that in fact, it wasn't 12 centers who were doing individual studies to which the FDA or other bodies would look at and say, well, I can't, they don't, it doesn't all fit, you guys are doing, but harmonize how you collect data, harmonize what you're doing so that um, the approval process goes faster. And if you look just even at the, the um, Lutathera story or the first approval of a PRT agent, um, here you have something that was 20 years after being in humans. And that was because we had a lot of centers that were doing it, but they weren't doing it with authorized products. They were all doing it slightly different. There was no data harmonization and no regulator would look at it and say, oh, there's a body of evidence. I'm going to prove something that no one's bringing to me because I have data from all over the place. Yeah, I'll do that. So we need to make sure, and when I was here two years ago in, in, in Melbourne for the Theranostics Congress, my big talking point was, we need to make sure we don't do this in PSMA. Right. We had, you know, we had 20 years of net patients 
who were lucky if they found the right center. I don't know, you and I would not be having this interview together had I not gone to Toronto and I randomly ran into yeah. Dr. Baum. But we need to make sure that patients don't have to have random luck to get treated. Right that in fact that we shorten that time, yep. that that, um, that bridge um, is down across the valley of death and to get that bridge up, and that we use the knowledge that we, the, the experience that we had with um, 20 years of wandering the desert with um, PRT for neuroendocrines to shorten that for PSMA so that we come up with a registered product much sooner and save much greater lives. And that's really the message, and you know, I've talked to Dr. Hoffman here from uh, Peter Mack. That is the message that we try to keep going forward, that we need to harmonize what we do so that um, we're leveraging every patient that goes through a clinical trial, because they're incredible resources, and they're limited resources. They don't live forever, or if they're in a trial that's not that important, um, that there are resources not available for something. So. Let's make sure that every time we use that resource, we use it in a way that we can leverage for future things or future registrations or future data sets that will help us get towards a registration. And that's really, um, to me, the biggest, the, the biggest thing that I can bring to the medical community is let's not waste our time, you know, let's not waste our um, precious resource. And, you know, in return, Patients are really good with um, with working with governmental bodies, with um, bringing information out to other into other avenues, and to share their stories that can help things move faster. But in, at the end, we still need to go through those steps to make sure we can get a properly registered um, product, so that other people don't have to. Um, you know, my whole goal uh, as being a patient advocate is so that patients don't have to repeat the steps that yeah. I take. Yeah. Um, my whole thing in the Silicon Valley was how do you leverage anything that you do for um, just greater distribution because doing things at a small step is, you know, I call it hand-to-hand -hand combat, doesn't work very well. I guess what you're saying is we need to work together and not as everybody wanting to be the king of their own bit, a little bit, rather than work together to have a harmonized approach. A harmonized approach so that we can maximize our leverage, right? Yeah. So that we have a synergistic effect instead of a, a silo effect. Yeah. The silos are just, they don't work well. Yeah, yeah. But you, you also made the other point about patients being a valuable resource for mm -hmm. these things. Patients can also help other patients be recruited into trials and part of that is getting trials done quickly and often the main reason why a trial fails is they fail to recruit properly. So, so you can help us in that direction as well, right? Yeah, that's true and, and you know recruitment is a whole other probably three days of, of conference but it is the um, challenge of, of recruitment to make sure that we have good information and good knowledge out there so that um, patients and physicians, um, I'm, you know, I'm blessed, I'm very lucky. I go to a lot of these conferences and I hear about trials and, and important trials that other people don't hear about even though they're all, they're, you know, you open up clinicaltrials.gov and I only know it for neuroendocrine very well, but you know, there's 1,600 trials that are open right now for neuroendocrine tumors. Yeah. That's overwhelming. Yeah. There's not a possibility that I could figure out which one's the right one for me. Sure. So we also have to have some better method of working to find out which trials will help move the art forward. Right. And which ones suit the individual patient. Correct. And also just about knowing. I mean, I live in Melbourne. We, we've got a lot of... Uh, trials for prostate cancer and I had, uh, you know, I've, I've been contacted by oncologists who didn't know that we had trials going on in Melbourne who had prostate cancer and asking about information for it. Yeah. It's crazy. That it, it, is, it is completely crazy and that is, um, you know, the, the, it's a large set of topics on, um, on patient recruitment and figuring out how to, it's not only patients but <coughs> excuse me, even getting <coughs> Physicians to know what are the important trials and why, um, and and what will move the art forward. One of the things that I do as part of the NCI GI steering committee and um, the NCI uh, task force for neuroendocrine is that is what we discuss. What not the sixteen hundred? It's the 
we have a fine, especially in nets, especially in a rare disease space, we have a finite amount of patient resources. Yes. How do we use them in the most wide, the, the way that will solve the next question? Yep. Not, is drug A better than drug B? That's not a really good question. Is this pathway going to be more um, advantageous than this pathway right. so we can... Do we combine it with this? Do we combine it with that? Right. But, but not just random ideas, more of where do we learn and move the mountain higher as opposed yeah. to just other random data points? Yeah. And I think that's, that's the problem with so many trials that are out there that, that are recruiting is that there are a lot of trials that are recruiting that aren't moving the art forward. Yeah. And that's, um, that's a challenge. Right, because those trials are also Me Too type trials in some ways. In some ways, or some pet project of someone for an IND. I, there's a myriad of reasons, yeah. but they may not be there to move the art forward. We need to figure out the best way to use those valuable resources. Okay. Well, that's a great message to us, and, and a great message too is that, is, that, is that we can work together on this. Yes. Perhaps another way, I think, that patient advocates is also to be on ethics committees. Would that be a great way that patients... We are. Exactly. <laughs> um, we sit... I mean, there's a... Um, uh, and I'll make a plug for a um, PCORI. Uh, yeah. I don't know if you know that acronym. Patient Center Outcome Research Institute. And it is a large um, quasi-government-funded research organization that makes sure that patients are part of the stakeholders with doing um, to, for better outcomes. And if you look at whether it's the NCI, the FDA, um, and all the other um, the groups, they have patient advocacy as part of their, uh, or patient people who sit on panels. And there's just a wide opportunity, and patients need to know on how to take advantage of that. And actually, um, there's, a Trevor, uh, there's an entire database of patient-centered um, research that's sitting at PCORI that can be searched um, as well. And the NCI has resources, uh, National Cancer Institute, on how patients can get involved from preclinical through different phases, through imaging, through just an Im immense amount of opportunities. And I think part of it is we need to learn how to educate ourselves, and yep. we need to make those resources more available to patients for patient participation. Yeah, brilliant. Well, thank you so much, and thank you for being part of the podcast. Is there anything else you'd like to say? Um, you know, it's. I think when you're diagnosed as a, as a patient, um, you think, you know, certainly no one ever expects to be diagnosed, and, and so that's challenged. And then when you really look at it, you think there may be only two or three experts or maybe six experts in the world on your disease or who are doing really good work. And one of the things that I try to bring to patients and to the, the medical community is I've just been overwhelmed by how many people are involved in research and trying to move the art forward. And it's not six doctors. And actually, probably the six doctors that everyone can, re can think of aren't the people who are actually doing the real work and the real research. But there's hundreds and thousands and tens of thousands, even in the net community, yep. that are doing um, really great work in trying to solve this really big problem and have devoted their lives to um, working on nets or other diseases that we'll never hear about. But we've got to appreciate the fact that they're there, and we really appreciate all their work. Yeah. And it's great that we're making a difference. And without your help, I think they'd have a lot more trouble making a difference, and it might take forever. Now we're making a difference, and it's, and it's happening. Thank you. Oh, no worries. Pleasure.